for the next speaker, we have one of our old friends, Hendrik Hugh. Awesome. Let's go then. Um, so the talk is push it to the limit from canary deployments to canary clusters. So this me I hope everyone knows what a canary deployment is. I'm not going into details about that. But what we did at Luna was we wanted to push ourselves uh, to be able to simply have canary clusters. We could basically do a failover without downtime. We could spin up new clusters, see if it works, uh, so on. There's a lot of good reasons. And, and um, just to give some idea of the company that I work for now, it's called Luna, uh, luna.app. Um, we're not making an, a, a bank because we don't want um, banking to define us, just like um, Blockbuster didn't get to define Netflix, right? Uh, so we want to make everything that uh, gives the customers uh, a way to get more out of their money, whether it's banking, whether it's uh, investing in the stock market or in crypto or whatever. You can do it from one app. And you can get uh, Visa cards and so on. Um, yeah, so that's the company. We get a lot of traffic. We are heavily regulated as a bank. Um, and we need to be compliant, and you need to be able to do a failover in order to be that. So uh, we had to do that. About me, uh, my name is Henrik Hu, uh, a terrible last name, uh, internationally at least. Um, uh, horrible to pronounce. Uh, I think the French doesn't even pronounce any of it. Um, but yeah, I'm Scandinavian. I work as a platform engineer at Lunar. Um, so we, um, so if you heard the earlier talks today, uh, we are using a team topology. So I'm in the platform team and working there. I work in a squad called uh, NASA. Um, so we are inspired uh, by uh, Spotify having squats and. Um, um, Squat NASA has actually grown so much that we are in the midst of uh, splitting it in, into multiple teams. Uh, and we don't call them tribes, but we will call them uh, colonies instead. I do have interests. Um, I love cloud native. I've been working with Kubernetes since 2015, 16-ish. Um, and I also like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I uh, eventually bought a 3D printer, and I like to paint small plastic things that we then, um, as grown-ups, meet and pretend is alive and on a, an adventure. So um, that's me, uh, roughly. And there's a picture. <laughs> so uh, the agenda in this talk, um, I want to share the highlights of our tech stack, or the relevant parts, at least. Um, I want to show you how we initially did a failover. Uh, we had a long journey uh, in order to actually be able to do it. And then I want to present some of the changes we did in the second generation of failover at Luna uh, to get more speed and more uh, stability. And then I just want to mention something about chaos and then about the future of uh, the next generation of failover at Luna. So yeah, let's uh, let's dive into it. So we were on a journey, and I know there's five people here, but in the beginning there was actually two: it was Bjorn and Casper, my colleagues, and they worked really hard for roughly three years, getting the company moved from a monolithic architecture to microservices. Um, so we use um, uh, domain-driven design and team topology. And we also look into something like um, promise theory right now. So that's how we now organize teams and software and domains and, and responsibilities end to end streamlined teams. Um, and then we went from deployment pipelines to GitOps. And some might say, what? Um, but to us, it's really important that we separate those two. So we don't want uh, Jenkins to do CI, CD, and deployment. Because when you want to do a failover or want to do a new cluster up and running, you don't want to trigger have to trigger like 250 pipelines to deploy your stuff. Um, in that case, it's much easier to, to have a controller that will look at a Git repository. So the GitOps way of working. Um, we save our states in a 
the released state in a Git repository, hence GitOps. Uh, we've built some software that I'll uh, talk about to control releases. So when Jenkins stops, it will actually produce these Kubernetes manifests, put it in an S3 bucket, and then some other thing will take over. So that's the journey that build up to this story. Um, so let's see. Stack, yes, I'm from Denmark. We have a lot of companies that love plastic uh, toys. Um, but the stack that we run, we run Kubernetes as the foundation. This is to abstract away all infrastructure like uh, network, uh, compute, uh, metal, stuff like that, fans, I guess. Um, so everything runs on Kubernetes, or at least most of it. Uh, we have all our definitions in Git, and it works quite nice. Uh, we are in all three major clouds, so we are mostly in ours, or AWS, I think some people call it. Uh, we're also in Google, and we're also in Azure, or Azure, or whatever they call it. Um, and we have connected these with Linkerd, so we have links, and we work tightly with, uh, or closely with Linkerd. We actually pay for the services, which is really nice. Um, and we can then con connect services between clouds um, in Kubernetes. That's really nice. We use GitOps, everything is in Git, the manifests, and we have a controller on top. At the time this story plays out, we are on Flux 1. We have migrated to Flux 2. I'll get back to that at the end of the talk. Uh, but just to know that this story um, is when we were running Flux V1. Flux V1 is much more simple than Flux V2. They have about the name in common, that's it. Um, but there's some really nice opportunities in Flux 2 that I would like to come and talk about. Then we chickened out and we gave AWS or OWS or whatever we call them a lot of money and said, please uh, handle our state. Uh, here's the databases. Uh, so we use RDS uh, and that makes stuff a lot easier. And then we use uh, a rabbit, not out of uh, my hat, but uh, <laughs> A Q. Uh, we use loosely coupled systems. We want uh, as much as possible to be asynchronous. Uh, and the great thing about Rabbit is that you can federate it between clusters, which will become handy later. Beyond that, we have something like external DNS. So you can put some annotations on ingresses and services, and it'll actually manipulate uh, Route 53 and um, you can uh, then expose or you know connect or get the DNS working for our service, but you can also set the um, the routing weight uh, controlled by external DNS, which is nice. Um, and then we have two tools that we made ourselves. Uh, one is Shuttle. It's open source. Um, it's hard to describe Shuttle. Uh, it's it's like a translator from developers to infrastructure. So it, it ties really nicely together with promise theory um, where developers define desired state and then shuttle helps translate that to whatever we need. And that would in most cases be Kubernetes manifests. Um, but it can do a lot more than that. It's agnostic. It doesn't know anything about Kubernetes, but it can orchestrate these translations or generations. Then we have Release Manager, which is uh, like Cerberus. It has three parts. It has a CLI called HamCTL, uh, not ham as in the meat, but uh, ham as in the first uh, great ape in space. Uh, the chimpanzees beat us to that. Uh, and the name of the first chimpanzee was uh, ham. And then it has a release manager and a release daemon. The daemon runs in Kubernetes and uh, sees when things are uh, released. So this is basically the thing that takes it from the S3 bucket and then to the GitOps repository. And then it also notifies developers when something is actually running and the progress in Jenkins and so on in Slack. So developers needs basically three tools beside code. They need uh, ham, CTL, they need shuttle, and they need Slack. All developers don't need to know things are running in Kubernetes. We could shift to Nomad 
and most of them probably won't notice. So it's all about abstractions, and that's how we define the platform team with team topologies. We started with the bare metal and we moved up until we could start and smell a bank, and then we moved slightly down again, and that's our platform team. Yes. So, dun dun dun, the dramatic scene. First generation. So this is the thing that Bjorn and Casper uh, worked on, uh, the first generation of failover, how we did it with GitOps, because it's kind of tricky. Um, so we have a GitOps repo, and we have a main branch. And this is the first alert, right? uh, smell. Uh, then we have a cluster, we have a user, and I have to stress out this is not to scale, uh, or users are bigger than that. Uh, but they're connected to a Kubernetes cluster, or the services at least, controlled by Route 53 and external DNS. And we have, um, how do you say, uh, Flux pointing to a, a GitOps repository. Now these manifest defines what's in the cluster. One of them is RabbitMQ uh, that decouples all the services. And um, then when we need to create a failover, uh, what we did was we created a branch, and I know that's, yeah, we'll get back to that. And then on that branch, we made some edits, and these were mostly uh, cluster name and routing weights, uh, because that's the thing that you need to be different in a failover cluster, right, to be able to differentiate them and in order to shift traffic, because the annotations for um, um, external DNS are, are well, the annotations, right? They're, they're hard coded. You can't commit it to the same repo or the same branch because then it'll affect the other dev cluster if it's dev you're doing a failover in. Um, yes. And the cluster name was set on a lot of things to be able to see in logs and metrics what cluster is this happening in, right? So we needed to be able to differentiate them. But we made uh, edits and then um, we federated uh, the two clusters, uh, rabbit clusters, and then we started to shut down services in the old cluster and then services in the new cluster would take over. Then we would make some more edits that would lower the, the amount of traffic to the old cluster, some new edits in the new failover cluster that allowed more traffic into the new cluster. And then we would iterate on that until we were completely uh, in the new cluster with our users. When we had that, we didn't need the old cluster anymore, so we could just destroy it, blow it up, whatever. Um, and then we'd done a failover, which was kind of nice. But this had a lot of complexity in it. And um, once you were done with this, you would still need to merge this failover branch into the main branch, and then you would need to point uh, Flux to the to the main branch, right? And very few people actually like this. Now, I need to mention that our clusters are made with COPS um, at this time and still are. Um, and the funny thing is, there's nothing in Kubernetes where you can say, this is the cluster name. This is an identity. So you can differentiate these two. You have to do that yourself, apparently. Um, so challenges with the first generation, uh, a lot of complexity with this merge thing, and it, it just feels wrong, right? And there's a lot of, we automated all of it, or, or they did. Um, but still, if something failed, you did not want to be <laughs> in that call. Um, new deployments could stale, stall if they were deployed after the branching occurred, which was kind of annoying. Uh, they would eventually uh, get uh, released, but uh, it was not ideal um, because it was basically a code freeze, right? Um, few felt comfortable doing failovers, um, and we would be multiple people doing it. We would record the sessions and we would do um, write-ups about what happened, when and everything. It was a pain. And it took four hours to do a complete failover in production. Um, so that was a lot of time. That's relative, I guess. And 
none of this felt like in the spirit of, of GitOps, right? Um, you put something in Git and it should be reflected in your cluster. And then doing this edits and edits and edits back and forth and merging and stuff, that was just not right. Hi, we are Ethicode and we organize the DevOps conference. What developers really want is to see their software live. CICD minimizes the time from idea to software delivery. We would love to speak with you to learn how we could help you to remove the pain and uncertainty from your software development lifecycle. You can find us at ethicode.com. The links are in the description. And have a great time with the DevOps conference talks. So one of the problems was most edits we found was um, about the cluster name. So basically two things. The one biggest one was, was the cluster name. The other one was the routing weights, right? Because without the cluster name, we couldn't distinguish two active dev clusters during a failover. And we would like to see what happens in the new cluster and what happens in the old cluster. What fails? Do we need to roll back? And so on. And this was in, for instance, Fluent BitLocks. It needed to know the cluster name to ship that so we could see it in Humio. It would be external DNS uh, that would uh, need to know the cluster name. It would be the AUS IAM authenticator or the AWS IAM authenticator uh, would need to know the cluster name and some other things would need to know this. And we had a lot of automation that or scripts uh, that would change these things and do Git manipulations and stuff. So that was not ideal, but it was the first generation. We could say, we got this, we can do it, but we had to focus. Um, so let's talk about the second generation, more Lego. We created two controllers. We created something we call the cluster identity controller, and it basically gives a cluster identity. It, will, uh, it has strategies to find out what the cluster is that it's running in. So if you deploy it with cups, it will look for specific places where cups puts the name that we found. And then it will create a config map in each namespace with this cluster name. And it'll keep doing that and listen for new uh, namespaces and so on. The other one was a routing weight controller that adds annotations to increases and services based on the routing weight objects that we create. So these routing weights objects were uh, custom resources that we made with our controller. And to look at a um, cluster identity, you could see K, that's kubectl, uh, get config map cluster identity in the namespace operators, give it as YAML. And you can see here that uh, we have a key value, cluster name, and then the name of the cluster. Now, applications can use this. Um, um, and also, um, uh, Fluent Bit, we can use this to mount that and use in uh, filters and stuff. We can use it in the uh, AUS uh, IAM uh, controller, authenticator, sorry. Um, and, and we actually succeeded in getting this into every single thing that needed. So we didn't need to use Git anymore for that. It was something the cluster knew. Right? If we look at the routing weight uh, object, you can see it has a name, it's in a namespace, uh, and it basically has annotations here. So these are the annotations it will set on the given objects that is controlled by the routing weight controller. You can see here that it has an aus weight and a value. So this is how you can manipulate the routing weight in a cluster on a cluster scale. And then the uh, identifier, and this is where the cluster name um, usually is the same as the identifier. It also sets the cluster name because the beauty of this is this routing weight object is deployed to all dev clusters, but the routing weight controller will only uh, acts on routing weight objects that has the cluster name that matches the cluster it's running in. Sneaky. It has a dry run functionality, so you could set it to true, and then it'll, it won't actually change anything, but it will spin out the locks as if it was, which was nice in the beginning. We don't use that anymore. 
And then if we look at an ingress, you can see we have this annotation routing Luna tech control true. So this means this object should be controlled by the routing weight controller. If it's not there, it won't touch it. And you can see that it'll set these two annotations. So this allowed us to do failover in a much smarter way, because now we have a main branch and we have a cluster that points to it, a small user up here that connects to the cluster. And now we have a new service called cluster routing controller resources. And we treat this as any other service we want to release. And in it, we have a, a shuttle, a YAML manifest that I'll talk to about, about later. We basically spin up a new cluster with cups. By that, there are traces somewhere about the name of the cluster. We deploy the cluster identity controller. It'll find it, create config maps all over the place, and we'll uh, deploy the routing weight controller. Now, the routing, routing weight controller won't find any objects for this cluster because we haven't done it yet. But what we'll do is we'll, in the routing weight resources, have this file, a YAML file. This is the the promise, basically. So here you can see in dev, we have weights, we have a cluster name and a routing weight. So right now, there's only one cluster defined. We have shuttle commands or scripts, delete routing weight, add routing weight, adjust routing weight. And with these, we can actually um, manipulate this desired state and uh, release manifests to uh, GitOps and thereby going out to every dev clusters. So we run the shell commands, it'll edit the manifest file. It'll be on the same, uh, it'll be on a feature branch and then merged, of course, uh, and released. And it'll actually end up with some manifest in the main branch in the Git repository. Now the routing weight controller will react and say, ah, oh, okay. And then it'll put annotations on the ingress objects and services objects that are controlled by it, and then external DNS will react and not before. So now you can see we have two clusters in dev, one with 80 and one with 20, and then external DNS will manipulate Route 53. And then we can just run these commands from a CLI and it'll actually shift the traffic more and more and more. Super easy. So then uh, we federate like we did before. Um, We've removed the old cluster and there's nothing to merge or anything. We have a new version of this and we can run the delete routing weight. That'll delete the old cluster if we want to clean up. If we don't, it doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, so that's the generation two. So the effort we put into this was we, can, we created two controllers or operators, the identity controller, the routing weight controller, we roughly made 17 failover runs in dev in a two month time period. And every iteration led to improvements, which was really nice. The results was that everyone in Squad NASA can do a failover in production if they want to. The failover operation is down to five automated steps that these are actually shuttle commands. No GitOps branching, which was really nice. And we went from spending four to five hours performing a failover to 40 minutes. Now in, the, in prod production, we do spend an hour because we want to test more while we are dialing the knob. Audit logs, we can see what happens all the way through. Uh, we have it in Git, so audit logs uh, from regulations, we can see exactly what happened in Git, no rewriting or anything. So that's also nice. Problems with generation two is our cluster identity controller has to have these strategies to find the cluster name based on the installer, which is really irritating. Please, Kubernetes, give us that one text field. Right? That would be so awesome. So by the way, the chaos I talked about, all of this was done with spot instances in dev. So we use spot instances and we have some of them. Uh, one day we had 80 new spot instances turning up in dev. Not all nodes are spot instances, but I would really recommend this because it actually showed us a lot of weaknesses in our setup, uh, race conditions and stuff. Um, so highly recommendable and it's cheap. Um, so the future, the third generation uh, looking into the future. We migrated from Flux to Flux v2. They have nothing in common but the name. But 
Flux 2 has this dependency graph that you can define in the, in the customize. And that will take some of the complexity from our scripting away. So we definitely want to do that. We also want to migrate from CUPS to Cluster API to get a better GitOps experience than when creating clusters. Now you have to backfill to Git. That feels really, really wrong. And we're looking into migrating our Terraform to Crossplane, also again to get a controller on top of it. And this whole GitOps thing, Terraform, you also do this backfilling, which is really annoying. We do use something like uh, Atlantis, but it's just not the same. So with that, I have a couple of minutes left for questions. I guess uh, the good folks, Adrian and Kevin, will magically reappear. Hello. Yep, we are here. Awesome. I'll just put the last slide here with the open source links and some context. Yeah, we're not letting you go uh, without questions. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Um, then for all attendees, please, if you have questions, drop them in the Q&A box. you find it to the right. If you click on sessions and then beneath that in the Q&A, you can post your questions. Um, so yeah, we have one question there from Marco. Um, he says, you mentioned promise theory twice, once when talking about the organization and once when talking about shuttle. Can you yes. outline how you used PT in the organization? Yeah, so we are currently uh, studying it and finding out how it actually relates to uh, team topology, um, um, domain-driven design, and how we work and how uh, we communicate between squads and uh, and domains or colonies, if you want. Um, I think promise theory is one of the most um, what do you say overlooked or you know thing. Uh, Kubernetes was based on promise theory. Uh, I would highly recommend to look up Mark Perez, I think he's called, who made promise theory. He has some really great videos on his YouTube channel. Um, but basically, it's about uh, instead of telling other people uh, what to do or how to do it, you tell them uh, uh, your desired state, basically. This is what I would love to end up with. And then the ones who actually do it, figure out how to do it because they then they are empowered to resolve conflicts um, and the same here shuttle developers define a define uh, a desired state in a shuttle.yaml file this is what we want for application we don't really care where you run it how you do it just make it so and then shuttle will translate that desired state into an actual desired state for kubernetes in this case but it could be for nomad or whatever um, so that's how shuttle fits into that. Um, but uh, I can, I, I'm working on a talk about uh, promise theory. It's really, really awesome. It's like understanding, um, uh, how do you say, atoms before you understand uh, molecules, right? It, it basically describes a lot of the stuff, the good stuff that we do nowadays and should be doing. Cool. Looking forward to the talk then. More questions. More questions, yes. Nikolai is asking, uh, did you choose Flux over Argo CD because of some specific differences in features? Or did you just need some GitOps controller? Well, we needed a GitOps controller, but uh, the choice was not, I was not at Luna at that point, but they choose Flux. Uh, I think it was because they liked the idea of having the controller running in Kubernetes and not outside. And I know. Argo can also run inside and so on. I'm not sure why they choose chose Flux. Um, I know Argo has some workflow that you can do as well, but um, we have Flux. I would say if you plan to migrate to V2, uh, you should be careful. Um, if you delete the Flux namespace in Flux 1, nothing happens. If you do it in Flux 2, all your customized objects are deleted and the Flux controller will clean up your cluster. So don't do that. Okay, good. Uh, yes, so we have a bit more time. Um, Daniel is asking, how do you implement database schema changes and rollbacks into your GitOps release workflow? Yeah, so we had a talk in one of our guilds uh, last time about this and um, it's 
currently uh, a service will have a, a update um, when it starts up to do the uh, schema change and then they have to test it again. But there are some problems with this. Uh, we don't use a big fancy tool. I know you can buy tools that can control these things, but I've also heard nothing's perfect. We have been playing around with the idea of um, doing it slightly differently, but we haven't anything concrete yet. Uh, we've been playing a bit about the idea of having the same service as an init container. Um, and then simply exit uh, with a zero or, or one, depending on how it went, and then the actual container. Because you don't know how much time the upgrade will take, and then your readiness probes and your mm -hmm. readiness probe will kill it sometimes. So we were thinking about doing something like that, but uh, we haven't done anything concrete yet. But right now, it's in the developer's hands. And when it goes wrong, we have a meeting at 8 o'clock at night, and we clean up. So. I see. So then also no automated rollbacks in there? Uh, I don't know if anyone has that. Um, I know some don't. Cool. Thank you. Um, to me, I was asking, uh, if you want to build a resilient architecture um, with stable production first and then failovers, you have a lot more things to take care of. Um, what would you call the top three priorities to focus on first when you're getting started? Yeah, so so the journey for us was to get away from a monolith and away from um, deployment pipelines. Uh, we really felt that GitOps was the way to do this. So I would definitely go on a journey towards GitOps first, and and, and that's and. I mean, GitOps is also extremely compliant with uh, with promise theory, right? Because you have an intent or promise, and then someone else will actually do it. Um, whereas on a deployment pipeline, you usually have stuff that do stuff in another place, right? So that's that's um, obligation theory, basically the exact opposite. Um, also, if you want to create a failover cluster you need to deploy, we have roughly 260 services, right? I mean, if you want to kick off that many pipelines to deploy your stuff, that would be madness, right? Here, you can just deploy Flux and then everything's up. Much easier. We have um, one question from Vijay Lakshmi. Yes, I'm trying to, I, I hope Henry, you have it there as well. Um, I read it through once, but it wasn't entirely clear to me. Anyway, I'll read it out. At what scenario um, could we look for multi-cloud strategies? Every cloud, as every cloud provider more or less the same way of services are trying to understand why we would make use of multi-cloud platform. Yeah, so we are multi-cloud uh, in the sense that we run different services in different clouds. We don't duplicate right now because there's no value in it for us. Um, but I, I mean, we we sometimes buy companies and they will be in one cloud like Azure. And we are then in the platform team able to reach out, create a Kubernetes cluster, link them together, having locks and compliance and everything in place. And they just need to start shipping things in that. Um, so that's made that part a lot easier. Um, but we want to gravitate towards um, um, a Kubernetes cluster running in ours um, because that's where we have the most confidence and the most tooling right now. But we are in the three big ones uh, for those reasons. So over time, your infrastructure is converging to AWS? Yes, hopefully. Hopefully, <laughs> if reality <laughs> permits. Yeah. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure.